A lot of notions surround the concept of death. For some, it's moving on to the next existence. For others, it is the extinction of the body and soul. And the Bible has its own way of defining death. And it's not a Western point of view. And that's what we're going to talk about today on this episode of Ancient Egypt and the Bible. Unless the Lord returns, everyone watching this video will someday die. And this has been the state of affairs since Adam and Eve. Today, we are going to look at the issue of death in the Bible. Now, as a guiding principle, we have to recognize that the Bible is an ancient Near Eastern book. And as such, we need to understand the Bible through the context of the target audience. In this case, ancient Israelites, those who lived in the Late Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and those who came back from the Babylonian exile. The people of the ancient Near East believed that humans had a soul, and that the soul survived after death. This understanding was true of Egyptian funerary myth, as well as Mesopotamian beliefs. The funerary customs and texts indicate that they believed there was a part of the person that survived death. The contextual understanding of death is that the body and soul separate when the body ceased to live. Now, supporting the idea that ancient peoples believed death was a separation is that the same ancient Near Eastern cultures believed that separation was not necessarily permanent. For example, the Egyptians believed that the spirit could return back to its body every night or inhabit another proxy body. This belief is predicated on the idea of idols being a statue or body that a spirit or god inhabits. This language of idols is used to refer to the creation of mankind in Genesis 1.26. The Hebrew words salem, images, and demote, likeness, are both words used of idols. All this comes out of the contextual understanding of the creation in Genesis 1 being structured using temple language as a precinct of God's sacred space. And mankind was intended to be God's images of himself within his holy temple. Therefore, in the ancient Near Eastern context, death is a separation of a spirit from its body. But how does the Bible see this relationship between the body, soul, and death? For this, we need to read Genesis 2, 15 to 18, and chapter 3, verses 1 to 24, and step into the text to discover the meaning of death in the Bible. So with that said, let's get into the text. From Genesis 2, 15 and 18, quote, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. For the Lord knows in the day you eat it from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave it also to her husband with her, and he ate. 
Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman who thou gavest to be with me, she gave me from the tree, and I ate. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every other beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now, the man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. And the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now, lest he stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the Tree of Life. So, that's the text we are going to be examining. Now, let's break it down. Genesis 2, 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. Man was placed in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. So man was made to live and dwell in the garden in the presence of God. The garden was God's sacred space. It was a holy place a place where life and purity reigns. And humanity was intended to be vessels of God's image, a reflection of a being like himself that God can enter into a relationship with. And we see from the text that God spoke to Adam and had a companion-level relationship with the man. And man suffered no trauma from talking with God. Then the Lord commanded the man, that he was free to eat from any tree of the garden. All the trees were available as food to eat. Man could eat freely and without restriction, except from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God commanded the man that he was not permitted to eat from the tree. God explained that the consequences that in the day they eat from the tree, they, quote, literally saying, Dying, you will die, which is a way of saying that death was assured. Furthermore, 
Adam and Eve would have understood what death was on some level. All they would have to have done is pluck a leaf from a tree. That leaf separated from the life of the tree would have withered and died even if the life of the tree carried on. Now, the reader here is led to believe that the humans would experience instant death as if they had just eaten cyanide. But when Adam and Eve do eat, and contrary to the reader's expectation, that doesn't happen. This instantly challenges our assumptions as to what death actually is. In the moment after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the two humans seem fine. But something is happening all around the humans, suddenly and in subtle ways. Quote, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. The first sign something has happened is that their eyes are opened, and they noticed they were naked. So they made clothes from fig leaves. Readers from the ancient Near East would understand that fig leaves are not appropriate for clothing. Fig leaves contain a latex that has furacumarins in it. These substances cause a burning sensation and itch. Ouch. It's a bit like stuffing a cactus down your crotch. It's also important to understand that this text is not explicitly about sexual shame. Instead, the humans immediately realized that they were exposed to the environment. Yes, they were naked and unashamed, but they're also now realized that they no longer have the feeling that they're protected and safe. This was their first taste of death. Man was no longer integrated with, but separated from his environment, and nature was hostile to them. Quote, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then God walks in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, the cool of the day is early evening, the time when every creature is out because it's cool and pleasant. However, the humans are hiding. God already knew what man had done. Quote, Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of thee in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? God confronts man with his disobedience and sin. This confrontation shows a divide between God and man. Man is no longer in relationship with God. The relationship has changed. Man is no longer in that intimate, companion-like relationship with his creator. Man is now living in fear. And there is now a separation, a distance between God and man. Man was now positionally dead to God, even though there was no physical death that had occurred. Quote, And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me she gave me from the tree, and I ate. When forced to account for his action, Adam blames both God and the woman. He blames God for giving him the woman, and blames the woman for giving him the fruit. So now, there's not just a separation between man and God, but between man and woman. The two halves of humanity are now divided to the degree that each gender no longer can relate to the other. The man has died to his other half. And as a further consequence, 
he ends up also being separated from his children. Quote, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The woman echoes the fact that mankind is separated from the spiritual or angelic realm. The serpent here is not a snake, but a cherub, Ezekiel 28, 13 to 15. He was a throne cherub and represents the spirit world. The disobedience of man creates a separation between the spirit world and mankind. So while man is an embodied spirit in his mortal state, he is separated from the greater spiritual reality. Moreover, man also became further separated, undergoing the death of his personal identity. The more he sins, the more detached he becomes from his quality as an image of God. This creates a divide of the mental self, and the sinful nature is constantly at war with him. Left unchecked, this leads to unhealthy life choices, mental instability and double-mindedness, and judgment in the life to come. James 1, 5-8, 2 Peter 2, 12-14. And quote, So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim, and the flaming sword which turned in every direction, to guard the way to the tree of life. Man is finally forced out of the garden, in the middle of the night, into the darkness. Remember, this pericope began in the evening, in the cool of the day. And now, the cherubim and the flaming sword, better known as seraphim, are now against mankind. Cherubim and seraphim together protect sacred space. The reason why the seraphim are called the flaming sword is to prevent the reader from confusing the Nakash serpent, the shining one of polished bronze, from the protective seraphim serpents. Together, the cherubim and seraphim drive out all impurity from God's sacred space, which is the garden. And now, there is enmity and separation between man and sacred space. This explains the separation of sacred and profane space and that man is consigned to the profane. He is dead to the sacred. To recap, the reader was led to think that man did not die in the day he ate, when in fact, death was multiplied in man on multiple levels became profligate, destroying every connection that man had. Man was separated from his God, from his environment and with nature, from his wife, from his children, from his own identity becoming conflicted within himself, and from the spiritual realm, and even the potential for having relationship with God again, being cut off from sacred space. These forms of separation multiplied upon themselves, spelling utter ruin, destruction, and disaster for mankind. And all this took place before a single human had ever physically died. Now, it should be readily apparent that Genesis and the ancient Near Eastern context regard death as a kind of separation. Therefore, considering the ancient Near Eastern context of the idea of death, it appears that Genesis not only agrees with the ancient Near Eastern idea of death, but doubles down on it and amplifies that idea, not just restricting death to the death of the body. And we should observe that in the New Testament, eternal life is a resurrection of a spirit into a new body that can enjoy an everlasting relationship with God. Likewise, the second death has a quote, Resurrection of Judgment, end quote, John 5.29, where God gives the reprobate a new body as an act of grace, but with the reprobate's desire for everlasting separation. We have to understand that a soul without a body would be unable to communicate with its fellow exiles, and therefore 
would be consigned to impotency without any means of agency or interaction within the world of their final destination, which would ultimately lead to madness. Even in judgment, God still shows his kindness and mercy even to those who reject him. The new body for the reprobate is a parting gift, a final act of grace. So there you have it, the biblical definition of death. We hope you found this interesting and learned something. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time on Ancient Egypt and the Bible.